Hi everybody, welcome, thank you very much for coming. My name is Mark, and I hate self-introductions. Who else, anyone else help hate self-introductions? <laughs> They're really annoying, right, when you have to say, oh, why don't you introduce yourself? I always hate it. <laughs> because uh, you could say to someone, hi, uh, my name is Mark, uh, I have a master's degree in applied linguistics from Sichuan University, uh, I'm the Managing Director of SMAC, Improv Shanghai. You know, you can say all these things, but it doesn't really matter. You're going to forget. It's not until you actually experience something that it will be important and you'll be remembered. You know, I could be a child doing the exact same thing, saying the exact same thing that I'm doing here, and it would all matter the same. So, today, what I would like from you is we're going to make this a little more interactive. You know, because I am the, the Business Development Manager, and managing director, those are big titles, of Smack Shanghai, which is an improv company here that uh, has been running in Shanghai for about 10 years. Has anyone heard of improv? Mm -hmm. Oh, a couple of you, okay, great. So we're gonna do a few simple improv exercises today. It's okay, don't worry. It won't hurt too much. But is that okay if we do that? Get a little out of our comfort zones, get warmed up a little bit, is that all right? Sure. So if it's okay, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and if you don't have someone next to you, oh, I see a lady over there who's sitting all by herself, too. Why don't you come on over here and sit next to this lady who's also sitting all by herself? Don't worry, everyone's going to stand up. Find a friend, everyone make a friend. She needs a friend right here. I counted, there's 14 people in the audience right now, so everyone should have a friend. Turn to the person next to you and say hello. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Stand up and let's all move over here with your new friends. Would you please stand over here? Take your seats and we'll move on. Thank you guys very much. That was amazing. So that was just a little taste of one of the improv activities that I have used in my time to help people learn about leadership. Oh my goodness, this got cut off. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that second sentence really mattered. <laughs> Let me ask you guys really quickly, who is a leader that you find inspires you? Who is someone that you call a leader that you think makes you feel good? That you would say is a role model to you? Somebody you look up to? Shout it out. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say Barack. Barack, yeah, yeah, very much. Absolutely. Anyone else? Like for me, my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, my dad. Shout it out. Yes, sir. My uncle. Great. Great. Now, is your uncle a man of power? Is he like the president of the United States? Like you guys, you know? No. So, what is it about your uncle that makes you feel inspired? If you don't mind sharing. Uh, he actually is a person who has self-control situations, uh -huh. problems. Uh, I mean, in, in, for instance, in my case, my dad is very, very, very easy to get upset. Mm. But my uncle is very quiet, very stable. When there is trouble, how to handle it. Mm. And he's smart in decisions, so that's why. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So when you're with him, how do you feel? I feel safe. Great, thank you very much. That's kind of the point, is that great leaders are people who inspire us, not necessarily because they're strong and powerful, because I'm sure that, did you ever meet Michelle Obama? Did you ever meet Barack Obama? Did he ever do anything for you? No. No, it's because we see them and we're inspired by them. They make us feel safe. I know I definitely felt a lot more safe when Obama was the president. <laughs> now, and your uncle, when you're hanging out with your uncle, or your dad, or whoever it is that you feel inspired by, they make you feel safe, and you look at them, you admire them, not for what they have done for you, but because of what they represent. So, a little bit about my story. Uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago now, 
Uh, this is what I thought a leader was. I was in the army training to be an officer. And I saw people like this, and I'm like, yes, that's a leader right there. He's got a gun, he's got the rank, he's in control, he's telling everyone else what to do, he knows everything at all times. And that was what I aspired to be. I wanted to be this guy here. But I got a new idea of what leadership meant when my army career ended and I came to China and I've done a couple of other things. It changed drastically for me being officially a leader. Uh, I was a staff sergeant at the end of my time in the army. And then I came to China and I was suddenly not that anymore. I had a little crisis in confidence. So I'd like to pose these questions to you. Do you think you're a leader in your life? Oh, I see some people. Yep, yep, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Uh, can I ask you? I saw you first. Go. Was that a nod? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why are you so confident saying yes, you're a leader? Uh, because I made uh, my important decisions each time from my own will. Okay. Great. Great. So you feel like you're self-led. Yeah. Great. Okay. Nice. That's a very that's a very nice answer. I was kind of expecting someone to say, because I'm a manager at Fortune 500 company. But no, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, does anyone think they're not a leader? Raise your hand and say, no, not a leader. Are you just shy, or do you see through what I'm doing? Does anyone feel like there's no way they're a leader at all? Yes. Why do you think that? Yeah, that's right. If you say do this, they maybe won't do it. Uh, I don't trust people, so I feel I'm not a leader. Okay. Do you have friends? Uh, yeah. Do you have a family? No, a family no. Okay. Do you have coworkers? Uh, yes. Do you have? Uh, yeah. So, do you think you can influence them? Do you think that if you did something really great to make them feel safe? or to make them feel inspired, or to look up to you, even if it was something small, do you think that would change how they felt about themselves? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Give it a try. See what happens. Because my answer to this is yes, everyone is a leader in your life. As long as you know someone, you can be a leader. Maybe just not in a way that you think of being a leader. Just like me, uh, so I don't carry around a gun anymore, and I don't have the uniform and the badge anymore, and so I thought, I'm not a leader anymore. But you know what I did when I came to China? Uh, 12 year, 11 years ago when I came to China, I thought, I need to make money, what can I do? Of course, the easiest thing to do in China, the easiest job for anyone who looks like me to do in China is teach English. So that's what I started doing. And I realized, oh my god, I have so much power in the classroom. These little kids. They, I can make them listen to me. <laughs> I can make them do what I want them to do. It was really amazing. Um, but that brings me to the next challenge that I had, was that looking at these little kids, it was really hard for me to get them to do what I wanted them to do. And if, is anyone here a teacher? Yeah, so you guys know, what's the biggest thing that teachers say is hard for them? What's the biggest problem that teachers talk about? Management of the kids? Yeah, classroom management. How do I get the kids to do what I want them to do? It's not easy. And I felt like it was something really, really hard. And I struggled a lot for my first year or two. I thought, nope, can't do it. That's it. Can't do it. It's over. What's something you think you can't do? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> but you can if you want. <coughs> Is there something that you think you can't do right now? Too hard, impossible. Tried it, failed, oh well. Sing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. Me too. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. But let me explain to you why perhaps you think you can't do that. Um, elephants are huge and strong. We all know that, right? But they're born quite small. Uh, Elephant trainers have, or they used to have, a very interesting practice where when an elephant is a baby, they put it on this little chain. 
you know, and it's just strong enough that the elephant can't break it, and they can't pull it out of the ground. And when they're a baby, they try and they try and they fail, and they try and they try and they fail, and then eventually they just give up. And so it eventually gets so bad that when they're full grown, right, a huge, strong, thousand ton, thousand huge, I don't know however big elephants are, all they have to do is put a little rope around their foot. And when the elephant feels that rope around their foot, they go, oh, I guess I'm stuck now. <sighs> and they've done other experiments. Uh, has anyone seen this one? It's very cruel. Yeah. Back in the 60s, before psychologists had morals, they did this exercise where they took dogs and they put them in this pen that looked like this. And the pen would... Um, have a floor, a metal floor, and one would shock it. There'd be an electric shock. And when that shock came, the dog would jump to the next one. But then, what they did is they shocked both sides a few times. So the dog would jump to one, get shocked, jump to the other, get shocked. And they did that only a few times. And then eventually, the dog learned to just stay put and do nothing when they got shocked. And so, when they turned off, uh, the shock on both sides, and there's only shock on one side, eventually the dog just didn't jump. It got shocked and just stayed there. This is called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness means you were taught that you can't do it. Somehow, they conditioned you to think you're not capable. When you're a baby, you tried everything. As a baby, you'd go out of your way, you'd get into things, you'd pull things off of shelves, you'd cry, you'd hit things. If you've ever seen a baby, they just pull everything apart and go anywhere that they want. They're not scared of anything. You have this kind of attitude when you're a toddler. This is what's going through your mind, for most of us. But then, you know, you start to have some negative experiences. And of course, everyone has big emotions, Something happens you don't understand, it makes you upset, it makes you cry, uh, and you get into this cycle. Um, there is one very, very vicious circumstance that we have all experienced. Every single one of us here, I'm pretty sure, has experienced something that taught us to be helpless. For most people, their traditional education you learn there's something you're just not good at. I'm sorry, D minus. You get a number on a paper that tells you what you're worth, and it's not always great. And there's someone in a position of power telling you you're not good enough. You can't do it. I'm sorry, and at some point, we all just give up. Well, I gave up on math. To this day, I suck at math. Terrible because I had a very bad math teacher who made, actually a few, very bad math te teachers who made me feel really bad about myself. So how can we get over this? What happens is that when you have an experience, we tend to generalize experiences across the three P's. Something bad happens and we say it is pervasive, it is everywhere. It is persistent, it is all the time. And it is personal. This happened to me because I'm bad at math. We end up telling ourselves ourself things like this. I'm just not good enough, all the time, everywhere. And the truth is, this is just kind of how our brain is wired. It's kind of hard to escape the three Ps. Something bad happens, so you think it's persistent, pervasive, and personal. It's kind of hard to get away from that. It's hard to just say, well, Mr. Robinson is a bad teacher. Oh yeah, well, Mr. Thompson is also a bad teacher. Oh well, Mr. Fabrizio is also a bad teacher. No, that couldn't be possible, right? It must be me. It must be that I'm not smart enough. But the good news is, you can do this the other way too. <laughs> you can make things persistent, pervasive, and personal in a good way. I'm sure that there are things that we all have that are like this. No matter what, I can do it, I'm good enough, I, I got this. No problem. It's okay if I make a mistake, it's okay if I fail, I'll just try again. No problem, right? 
Why is it that we have some things that are like this and some things that are like this? What's going on? Well, I would like to pose to you that both are learned. Learned helplessness and learned optimism. Oh, I guess it's right. Learned optimism. Now, how do you get here? How do you learn optimism? Well, two words. Well, no, no, actually, uh, let's experience this before we move on. Uh, I would like to do a quick exercise right here. Um, so, can we all stand up again? Or rather, no, it's okay. Are you sitting with your friend? Are you sitting with your partners? If you're not, please go sit with your partner. Two by two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, one of the golden rules of improv is the first and most fundamental thing is that you say yes and. Whatever someone gives you, you accept it and add to it. Yes and. So we're going to play a little game called Remember When. So the two of you right here, uh, your partners, you're going to tell a story about a fictional vacation that you had. You guys went on a vacation. Right, it's over. It was two or three years ago. You had a great time. Where did you go? Uh, Netherlands. Yeah, you went to the Netherlands. Great. So you're going to turn to your partner and say, remember the time we went to the Netherlands? You remember the time when we went to the Netherlands? Thank you. Excellent. And you're going to say, yes. Yes. I remember the time we went to the Netherlands. I remember the time we went to the Netherlands. And what happened? So the trick to this game is, anything you say is acceptable. Anything you say is right, and good, and smart. So yes, I remember the time we went to the Netherlands, and? And we ate noodles. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> yes, we ate noodles. Yes, we ate noodles. Oh. And? Dutch yeah. waffles. <laughs> sure. No, it's not, you don't have to make a list of all the things you ate. <laughs> You're telling a story. Oh my god, it was such a great time. It was such a great time. We ate noodles and waffles. And what was special about these waffles? Uh, the waffle had a lot of fruits in it. <laughs> okay, moving away from the <laughs> On to something, something that's also interesting. Yes. Yes, and we... Uh, what did you do? Who did you see? Where did you go? To see... Cows. 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 Yes, you went to see cows. And? And we, uh, was a concert after that? Yeah, and, and it was a great uh, concert. Good. So the trick to this game is you're telling a story about something that happened. You know everything that happened. It's already there. Anything you say, your partner will accept <coughs> and build on it. So don't do this. Don't say, hey, remember the time we went to Thailand and then we went canoeing in the Great Canal in the mangroves and then you saw that alligator that was eating a chicken and the chicken turned out to be some nearby farmer's chicken and they came out and they thanked us for saving their chicken. By don't do that. It's too much information. <laughs> right? I'm not telling you a story about myself. But also don't give a yes. Don't just say Yes, I remember. <laughs> so a little bit, not too much. Okay, you guys got it? All right, let's give it a try. Uh, I'll give you a suggestion for you guys to start. Um, remember the time you went to, remember the time you went to the castle? <laughs> Go ahead, with your partner. At the same time. What kind of castle? Where is it? Uh, yeah, 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 what else? Interactive. Sorry? Interactive. Interactive. What do you, what do you mean by indirect? Interactive. Interactive. Oh, interactive, pardon me. Sorry. Interactive. Did you feel like someone was leading and someone was following? I feel like that. How? 
You felt like he was leading and you were following? Yeah, I was following. Okay, why? Um, because the story he started. <laughs> the story he started. Sure, sure. So, yeah, and he knows all what happened there, and then I'm like, I need to follow him. <laughs> but you, you also knew what was happening there. You yeah. guys went on vacation together. Yeah, but I, I made it like a little different way, but he consumed that part. Like I said, like we went that castle, it was like Christian castle, okay. and we don't have a relation. And then he just stopped with that conversation, he jumped to other things. <laughs> so he was like bleeding all the time. So Great. Like, okay, interesting. Yeah, that's a very interesting note. Did you find yourself pushing your ideas too much or letting your ideas go too much? Because we all have ideas. We all have the ability to be create, creative. Right? Like you said, that was very creative. Why was it creative? Um, what made it creative? Just you have to bring from your mind some interesting ideas what will happen next. And it's really interesting, yes. Did, did you accept her ideas too? Of course, we were in one team. Yes, the very well. Yeah. Like a very interesting story. Great. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad. Did you find you had some trouble at any point? Because you said you had to pull ideas from where, like, was it hard? Very easy. <laughs> was it easy, yes. Why was it easy? Because we have great imagination. Yes. <laughs> if I were to say to you, if I were to say to you, tell me a story about a fictional vacation you had to uh, Disneyland, go. Could you do it by yourself? Mm. He's like, yeah, I could do it, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be as fun or interesting? But you do it as easily. It would be predictable. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, this is the classic example of two heads are better than one. Uh, I'm doing a project right now. It's a lot of fun. Where I'm basically doing this with a friend, and she and I are telling whole stories. Uh, we've written three chapters. Like we do this, and then we write down what we said. We got three chapters of a book, and it's amazing. I could never have written this by myself. I'm way too stupid. She's also really smart, but I don't think she could have done this by herself either. Together, we are more creative. Mm -hmm. And we can also be more productive. In fact, I have a whole nother training, a whole full day training that I do about creativity and productivity based on this concept of how two people's ideas can come together, two people's power can come together to be better than the sum of their individuality. But it's only if you say yes and. You accept the other person's idea and build off it piece by piece by piece. Not a whole idea, entirely by itself. Just pieces put together by two individuals. Now, I saw most of you laughing and having a good time, right? Maybe not as much as you two gentlemen. But yeah, most everyone is at least smiling. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why are you smiling? Funny story. Why was it funny? <laughs> We had a little bit of sarcasm in it. Okay. Uh, maybe because we know each other. Uh, okay. So it make it, it makes it really easy to kind of like communicate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
It's dangerous. And this is a circumstance that we take to the workplace. Someone's idea could be valuable, but they're too scared to present it because bad ideas or mistakes, so-called mistakes, are punished. You're singled out and punished for your mistakes. Whereas, uh, you should be, perhaps, encouraged to think more like this. That's an amazing idea. Thank you so much for being forward. Thank you so much for coming forward and offering that idea. There is something valuable in it. Maybe I don't accept all of it, but there's something valuable in your idea that will take into consideration. I appreciate it. Let's talk more about this later. We don't tend to do that in the workplace. And we certainly don't do it in the classrooms. And so what ends up happening is, this is the scary bit, what ends up happening is that if you punish people enough for their mistakes, they end up just not having any more new ideas anyway. Creativity is a skill, it's a muscle, and it has to be exercised. But if you keep telling people, no, that's a bad idea, no, that's a bad idea, no, that's a bad idea, be quiet, you're wrong, what ends up happening is that that person just ends up going, fine, I'm not going to think of anything anymore, ever again, because clearly, I'm not smart enough. So we put people into these vicious circumstances, and they lose their creativity. And in the information age, that is the most valuable thing you have. I've done corporate training with uh, financial analysts, right? There's data, there's big data, there's software to predict trends in finance. How do these people still have a job? Because they're human, and they have the ability to see things that computers can't. They read the data in a way that only a human can. And they have opinions, and that is your value. Your ideas and your opinions are what keep you employed. Unless you're a factory worker, in which case you're going to lose your job soon anyway. You know, robots are going to be invented to replace you soon. But if you are someone who probably works and lives in Shanghai, it's likely that you only have a job because of your ability to create interesting and new ideas and opinions based on what you can come up with. So if you have this kind of an attitude, you're in trouble. If you're in a circumstance, in an environment where they make you think <coughs> like this, get out of it. If you are the leader of an organization that is making people feel like this, you need to change it. Uh, and with that, I think we'll take a short break.